The following podcast deals with the controversial subject of marine mammals in captivity. In the 35 plus years that have passed since Marine Land's closure, there's been a huge sea change in public opinion about this topic, and rightfully so. Throughout the course of this podcast, I hope to deal with these issues with honesty and sensitivity, while also acknowledging the tremendous awe, joy, and respect these animals have inspired in millions. And now, on with the show. In our fifth episode of LA's Own Marine Land, we're going to discuss the brief but bombastic 20th century fox era of the park, led by the king of disaster films, Irwin Allen. We'll also revisit one of the park's greatest joys and tragedies, the birth of Corky's first calf. Finally, the park goes into battle with two local cities over much-needed improvements. So grab your popcorn, walk up the zigzag ramp past the oval fish tank, and make your way to the Killer Whale Coliseum to get a good seat before the show starts. But before you sit down, there is one warning. If you're listening to this podcast in the first five rows, you will get wet. You may get soaked. Seven-tenths of our world is covered with water. In Los Angeles, there's a place that overlooks this vast frontier. A place of wilderness. A place of drama. Hold your breath. It's Marine Land plummet into global oceans teeming with life. Go eye to glowing eye with predators of the deep. Venture into a realm as intriguing as outer space. All a touch closer at L.A.'s own marine land. In 1973, 20th Century Fox began its three-year lease of marine land from Hollywood Park Racetrack in nearby Inglewood. 20th Century Fox put film producer Irwin Allen in charge of the massive endeavor, But the job didn't seem too big for the film mogul, who was known for epic disaster flicks such as The Poseidon Adventure, The Towering Inferno, and Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea. Twentieth Century Fox wanted Marineland to be their signature park, in the same way that Universal Studios had its tour, and Disney had Disneyland. Alan hoped to cast himself as Marineland's Walt Disney. Allen seemed to be the perfect person to assume such a role. He had produced films that were spectacular and appealed to children, while he also understood the business, accounting, and marketing sides of massive productions. Marineland had been in a slump for recent years and needed big, exciting ideas to get people through the front gate. Allen wanted to make huge changes to the park that would incorporate Fox-themed characters and attractions. Adding them to a marine park was a bit of a stretch brand-wise, but Allen known as the master of disaster, thought he could make it work. Alan wanted to have music artists from the Fox record label perform nightly at the park so people would come multiple times throughout the year. He also promised that by the spring of 1975, the park would have a $2.5 million voyage to the bottom of the sea ride. One of Alan's first big ideas was to boost park attendance during the lean winter months by throwing a winter wonderland extravaganza. Allen boasted to reporters of overseeing 212 craftsmen working on Winter Wonderland attractions. Winter Wonderland was billed as an all-new, old-fashioned holiday adventure for the whole family, and it cost Fox well over $500,000. The main selling point of this extravaganza was a thousand tons of real live snow, along with two frozen ice lakes for skating and a giant alpine snow slide. Other exciting attractions included a train called the Snowball Express, the world's largest Christmas tree rising 403 feet above sea level, and the possibility of seeing Santa ride a dolphin or throw a big mackerel to Orky and Corky. Now this sounded exactly like what Marine Land needed. Chutzpah and big, thrilling ideas that could compete with the likes of Disney. However, a winter wonderland in sunny Southern California was a bit harder to pull off than it seemed. The only snow to be found at Winter Wonderland was at the Snow Bowl, a long wooden table with snow piled on it where kids waited in line for five minutes and then threw snowballs at cartoon cutouts. The world's tallest Christmas tree was the Sky Tower with a few lights on it. A person who wrote to the LA Times said, quote, The ad said, dress warmly. The sight of hundreds of children wandering around in their heavy coats, mufflers, and galoshes, some had even brought sleds, was very sad. I just hope Irwin Allen keeps his disasters on the big screen in the future. With Winter Wonderland, the hyperbolic producer promised way more than he could deliver. 
Even though attendance at the park during Winter Wonderland was twice what they'd normally see that time of year, it was far below expectations. To further dampen the park's Christmas cheer, it was hit with a Los Angeles Superior Court civil suit. Marineland was charged with falsely promising children snow, and the suit described how the igloo was plastic. The giant alpine snow slide was fiberglass. The snow train ran through cotton on an asphalt walkway, and youngsters were not allowed to break snow over each other's heads as advertised. Marineland agreed to pay $15,000 in civil penalties and $5,000 in attorney's fees. It also agreed to a judgment which they would no longer tell children a snow-filled winter wonderland is available where it is not, and will not claim their stationary observation tower is, quote, the world's tallest Christmas tree. <laughs> Licking his wounds, Alan went back to attempting to work on incorporating 20th Century Fox properties into the park, but it never really came to fruition. In May of 1975, Alan split for a two-year contract at Warner Brothers. In 1975, Steven Spielberg's Jaws had people waiting in lines all around the block to see Richard Dreyfuss, Robert Shaw, and Roy Scheider capture a great white shark. Marineland's answer was to put a dead great white shark on display in a refrigerated case. But the display didn't last long. Fred Schaefer, Marineland warehouse manager from 1976 to 87. There was actually a couple of different great white sharks that were there. There was one big one they had when uh, 20th Century Fox had the park. And that was before 1978. It was like 6, 76, 77. And they took it down in the lower plaza and they had it like on ice underneath the tunnel where the underwater sea lion viewing was in the sea lion show. And they had that there. Just like, ooh, look at the dead shark, you know. <laughs> but then they had like a, um, a beach one that they, you know, their engine one they brought in and they had it in the giant oval tank. You know, and it was swimming for a little while, but then it didn't last. It was just a small one. You know, the one I remember at least. And that was in the early 80s. How long um, did they keep a shark on uh, ice? <laughs> How long did before uh, that sunk to high hell? Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't too long. It was there. It was like one of those things like come see the shark, you know, and it, it didn't last too long. Jaws also had a psychological effect on Marine Land's employees. Virginia Mason worked at the park in the mid seventies as a pearl diver. I remember when Jaws came out. I remember climbing up the little ladder onto the deck on, in the giant fish tank and having visions of my leg being pulled into the water. <laughs> It was. It, it did affect me a little bit, and I don't get scared that easily. And uh, but I remember having visions of, oh gosh, you know something's going to get me. So that that did play a mind uh, mind game on on. Me. <laughs> In 1977, 20th Century Fox declined to renew its three-year lease of the park with the Hollywood Turf Club, claiming it had lost money over the period. However, the Turf Club claims it made a profit. All in all, the 20th Century Fox era shouldn't be seen as a total disaster. Attendance jumped from 750,000 in 1974 to 950,000 in 1975, thanks to an aggressive marketing campaign. In 1976, there was a slight drop in attendance back to 900,000, but the park actually broke even for the first time in recent years. To further this growth, the park knew it had to make some big moves to stay relevant in the competitive theme park market. Sadly, the $2.5 million voyage to the bottom of the sea ride never materialized. That same year, for the first time, Marineland opened the giant fish tank to snorkelers. The Family Adventure Swim allowed visitors to rent a wetsuit, masks, snorkel, and fins for a 10-minute swim. The success of the Family Adventure Swim would lead to a bigger push to encourage more audience participation throughout the park. While the business side of the park was an ongoing problem, in the pools, Marineland's animal training program had grown to be among the best in the world. The entire program was based on positivity and putting the animals' needs first. Even when they weren't feeling cooperative, there are always ways to encourage them to come around. Bud Crames was a trainer at SeaWorld before coming to Marineland in the 80s. There's all sorts of behavioral techniques you use, and obviously you have to be as positive as possible. So you find something to build on, you find something that you can start showing them positive attitude and po positive reinforcement, that sort of swings it in the other direction. Basically, that's what we do. It's just try to find a way to make them 
find the, the joy and the, the pleasure. And always take a time out like a parent might do with their child. But uh, then you come back with a whole new attitude and a whole new frame of mind and, and start over again. When it came, comes to training, was this a day in, day out process of teaching new behaviors and reinforcing things? Or was it more like uh, you just from time to time do do work, do training type work to keep them kind of on point? Well, I think every time you are with them is considered training because you, you can slack off somewhere and lose ground or you can continually monitor them. A trainer's job is probably more just constant awareness of the, of the behavior. Down at Marieland was a little bit unusual in that, like I said, we had seven trainers, four working at any one day on four show areas. So a, a trainer would go from the whale show down to the pilot whale show, then back up the whale. So the actual training time was minimized. Although in the winter, we had a couple days off a, a week, and that's when we did a lot of our new behavior training. How did you demonstrate affection to the animals? Well, we used uh, tactile reinforcement, which is uh, you know rubbing them down, playing with them. They like to have water splashed on them, uh, hoses and stuff. They seem to enjoy that, that sensation on their bodies. And that's where we use the, the rub downs, you know, along their pectoral flippers or, or whatever. We would also, uh, you know, during play sessions, we could actually just kind of walk around the pool with uh, Orky. Uh, we would drop the pool to, to work on the pool down on the glass. A lot of times we had to do some repairs on the glass panels and we'd go in the water with them. And then while we're in there, we just rub them down and climb all over them. They just kind of sit there and just enjoy it it seems so that's a big part of training if you only work for food you're going to have problems but if you can find other other reinforcements you're in a much better shape fred schaefer that's been the the interesting takeaway that i found from interviewing people about this is that it's such a mutual 50 50 understanding between trainer and animal in which the, the conception i think most people have that don't do that for a living uh think it's you know 90 10 oh yeah no it's not like Okay, here I have a bucket of food. You can do what I want you to do, and that's it. Food is a is a reinforcer. There's only one small thing. There's a lot of secondary reinforcers, which is the interaction, which is getting out and getting the exercise and speed. That that's all very positive to the animals as well, you know. And they, and they you know, it's not just food that does it, you know. Mm-hmm. Both Marine Land and Sea World were, were were great places to work and train. Uh, what, what what were the differences though, and just the basic philosophy of the places? I know obviously Marine Land was a smaller, more family oriented park. Right. Um, well, the philosophy. Well, the neat thing working with the the young whales uh, is that we were starting from scratch, and so we we were training a lot of things that hadn't been done in years past because back, years past it was trainers were more. They're, mostly they were guys, and they did their basic shows that were, aren't I wonderful? And we changed it to more of a personality. When, when we started putting more women in the training department with us, we, we learned that relationships were the most important part. So that's why it enabled us to get all this massive number of behaviors with the whales, because we had, had both the, the relationship and all that. And I guess that was a big difference. Got up to, to uh, Marine Land, and the... the Love of the animals was there, but the limitations might have been the, the pool size or the uh, the fact that you couldn't separate them. Those were a couple limitations that that kind of challenged you, I guess is the, the word. Those are the biggest differences. Even though training massive orcas seems scary, for these brave trainers, it was just another day at the office. Animals don't, just don't snap for no reason. You see precursors. And if you're alert to your job and you're alert to the behavior that the animal normally portrays, you're going to see something before it happens and take the steps necessary to redirect and redirect, find a way to, once again, get on a positive attitude with them. I don't know what those signs would be. I mean, you, you might see a whale squirt water or or slap their tail or something. And if you see that, you say, well, that's not normal. Let's just get back on path here and, and head in the right direction. So that takes away a lot of that fear factor because not that you're controlling them, but you're understanding them. And I think that's that's the important part. Marine Land was a place where trainers taught innovative behaviors you couldn't see anywhere else. It had a lot of behaviors when I got there. You know, the basic jumps and bows, the, the high jump to hit the ball, the uh, tail wave, the count with their tail, you know, things that uh, showed off their different abilities. We trained a couple things after I got there that we thought were kind of fun. We trained, trained a tail whip that Orky would just put a head dive in the water and whip his tail around and it would put a, a volume of water into the stands the crowd that was just enormous. And of course, that's why people go there. They go to get wet. So 
we we honored that <laughs> gave it that chance so Gail Lawley was a marine mammal trainer from 1978 to 87 who did a lot of work with dolphins in her early years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I worked with Flipper, Simo, um, oh my goodness, um, Angel, and um, there was animals that were moved around a bit because we actually had a, a, a dolphin uh, breeding pool there at the same time. Mm-hmm. But there was a main group of, of animals, Peanut, Splash, Probably Splash, Peanut, Simo, and Flipper were kind of the original group. Then there was Skipper and Don that were two males that were that were quite bonded. So, yeah, I in fact, Simo was an interesting character because when I got there, he really, he was the one who, it would be interesting to know what else other people said about him, but he was the one who had the least number of behaviors of any of the animals, even though he'd been in the show for a long time. And so uh, he was my... My first uh, effort to train uh, an aerial behavior, I trained a forward flip with him. And it took me a few months, um, but I got to tell you, it was a spectacular (laughs) forward flip. And I think everybody kind of came to appreciate that, you know, that this, this animal was super sharp and there was lots more we could do with him. Oh, wow. So how do you teach a forward flip? So we have a, a set of tools we use in training, and it doesn't matter whether it's a dolphin or sea lion or a giraffe or a lion or, a, or an elephant. We have something called targets, just a long pole with a little float on the end of it. In the case of cetaceans, you would train them to touch their, the end of the rostrum to the target. This is your point of reference, and it's a way of guiding and shaping movement. And then we have a whistle or with trust animals, we might use a clicker as a way of saying good. And then, of course, obviously, your, your rewards, mostly food rewards. So with, a, with anything like a flip, basically, the target's quite long because you want the animal out away from the side of the pool. And you're basically slowly shaping this circular movement, first of all, underwater, and then slowly bringing it higher and higher. And so it, yeah. took, it took a few months to get, because, I mean, that's a dramatic, you know... It, it did, and it it took longer than normal, but I think it was also because it was my first time ever training it, and a lot of, you know, obviously the trainer bears a lot of responsibility for how things go. It was it was pretty cool. It kind of stands out as one of my one of my major accomplishments in terms of a behavior I was quite proud of. In 1976, Hardcore Brace Yovanovitch, a monster in the textbook business reorganized into five different divisions, university and scholarly publishing, school materials and assessment, periodicals and insurance, business publications and broadcasting, and popular enterprises. For the new popular enterprises division, the organization purchased three SeaWorld amusement parks in San Diego, Cleveland, and Orlando. Given the success of the SeaWorld parks, HBJ's gross sales came to 281 million in 1977. The company then began aggressively planning a fourth SeaWorld park in San Antonio, Texas. HBJ clearly knew the value that killer whales had in the fight for the theme park dollar. You may have noticed this show has no advertising. Well, kind of like PBS, we're relying on our listeners to support our efforts to preserve Marine Land's history through this podcast which has taken countless hours to produce. There are two ways you can help. First, you can make a donation to the show through PayPal by clicking on the Donate button on our website at marinelandpodcast.com. That's marinelandpodcast.com. Or you can take a deeper dive into Marineland's history by becoming a Patreon subscriber. At patreon.com slash marinelandpodcast, you can listen to full interviews with 19 people closest to the park. You'll also get the Patreon-exclusive episode, Making Marine Land, where I share the backstory of how this podcast came to be. It's all just $5.99 a month. Get started at patreon.com slash marinelandpodcast. Thanks for your support. Now back to the show. February 28, 1977 was a Monday, and the park was closed on Mondays and Tuesdays during the off-season due to low attendance. Trainers had suspected that Corky the killer whale may be pregnant because she'd been gaining weight and was reluctant to perform. Plus, her mate Orky was increasingly protective of her. 
A television crew was filming a commercial featuring the whales, and Orky kept disrupting the shoot by placing himself between the crew and his mate to protect her. Soon after, Corky went into labor. The camera crew rushed down to the observation windows to get an underwater shot of the berth. Corky was cheered on by Marine Land staff, who hung on her every contraction. Finally, when the magic moment arrived, Orky helped the newborn surface to take its first breath. The six-foot-long, 125-pound calf was the first killer whale to be born in captivity. Here's the baby. All right, here, here. What began as a joyous celebration for Marine Land staff soon turned to concern. The baby did not nurse immediately, but given the fact that this was the first captive killer whale born in history, they weren't sure whether it was cause for worry. As days passed, Corky was watchful of her new calf, but it still refused to nurse and seemed to be oblivious to its surroundings and requirements for survival. Marine Land staff watched the baby around the clock as it routinely banged up against the side of the tank. This little calf is driving us nuts with its apparent improvements and then, and then uh, particularly in the mornings, and then uh, resuming back to the stereotype swimming mode that, that uh, doesn't show any encouragement at all. It makes uh, making a definitive decision as to how to handle the animal very, very difficult. Because, uh, of course, the, the best way to do it is the natural way, but we feel we're running out of time. Marine Land staff encouraged the captain nurse by injecting him with an appetite stimulant. But still nothing happened. Now, keep his head up very gently, easing forward. Easing forward. And you go forward a little. Further. 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 Ready? Yeah. I think she's getting mad. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Let him go. How do we do? Okay. We were uh, anxious to note the behavior of the calf as it was undergoing restraint. And uh, I think as you saw, there wasn't much of a response. And this has been, of course, our concern all along with this calf, that it hasn't been a particularly responsive individual to, to the mother, to... Uh, external stimuli to anything, so quite concerned about that. The calf began to steadily lose weight and appeared to be listless. Our night engineer called me and said that the calf wasn't doing well. I came on in and, and the calf was up next to the wall and, and I knew it was in trouble. It was difficult to say now, much trouble. <laughs> So I just, we just stayed with it, or, or I did for a while, and then uh, the calf slowly sank. Corky attempted to get it to the surface and uh, didn't make it, and the calf didn't show really any response to want to come to the surface, and, uh, and that, was, that was the end. After just 15 days, the calf died. Marine Land staff believe the cause of death was brain damage suffered while it was being birthed. It's hard to imagine the pain that Corky felt after the loss of her calf, but tragically, this wouldn't be the last. In October 1977, the Hollywood Turf Club sold the park to Taft Broadcasting and the Kroger Company for $5 million. Taft Broadcasting had an amusement park group that operated parks throughout the country, including Kings Island in Cincinnati, Ohio, and Kings Dominion outside of Richmond, Virginia. Taft owned Hanna-Barbera, the animation company behind iconic cartoons such as The Flintstones, Yogi Bear, The Jetsons, Huckleberry Hound, and Scooby-Doo. Taft, who will call Hanna-Barbera going forward, planned a dramatic $2.5 million remodel of the park to add fresh attractions, a new entry gate, picturesque landscaping, and a $1.5 million marketing budget. The park would be rethemed Hanna-Barbera's Marineland and feature the animator's classic characters in the park. Marineland was closed November 1, 1977 for construction, forcing the park to lay off 43% of its employees. The park was scheduled to reopen by May of 1978 as Hanna-Barbera's Marineland.
Ed Capel, Marineland's group sales manager from 1979 to 87. Yeah, I think everybody wanted to see Marineland do well, and they were happy to see Taft come in with the Hanna-Barbera brand and the costume characters and uh, the investment that they were prepared to put in. And, and, and then they were allowing us to do what theme parks do. They were providing uh, funding uh, periodically to go ahead and do new attractions, which is what Baja Reef came about. Most theme parks, about every, oh, I'd say every, well, it used to be a lot of theme parks every other year they do a major attraction, and now theme parks do a major attraction pretty much every year. Marineland's sudden closure was a huge disruption to the lives of its menagerie of marine life. Tom Otten, head curator, told the New York Times that by the end of the first week, the animals were looking around for the people. Looking at empty bleachers is pretty tiresome. The park's general manager, Mike Downs, agreed, saying the animals were, quote, becoming depressed. Corky really missed contact with the people and spent a lot of her time staring through the observation windows, wondering where everyone went. (laughs) Assistant curator Tim Desmond said that with the dolphins, the dominant animals in the tank became obviously insecure, and the old pros that had been performing for 10 to 14 years wouldn't cooperate or went off their feet. You get an emotional vibe from the animals, and I could feel they were agitated. The social animals, Peanuts, Corky, Angel, and Spray, really missed people touching their backs and stroking their fins. This depression would come to a head in 1978 when Orky lashed out at one of his trainers. We'll talk about this on the next episode. The humans at Marineland were also having trouble during the park's closure. The city of Rancho Palos Verdes was slow walking its approval of the park's upgrades. On Christmas Day, 1978, a blunt headline appeared in the South Bay paper of record, The Daily Breeze. Marineland future faces costly, tough issues. The following is a recreation of Marineland's general manager, Michael Downs, appearing before the Rancho Palos Verdes Planning Commission to push for the $2.5 million project approvals. Okay, order, order. Uh, Next, we're going to hear from Mike Downs, the general manager of Marineland. Um, As you know, the park was recently purchased by Hanna-Barbera. The cartoon people. Fred Flintstone bought himself some killer whales. How about that? (laughs) Go go ahead. Go ahead, Mike. We're actually really excited about Hanna-Barbera. To keep us competitive, they're making some big changes that really need to happen. Uh, we want to make Marineland far more lovely than its competition down in San Diego. In the uh, first phase of this project, which needs to be done by May, we're going to change the park's entrance and move it over by the Sky Tower. Uh, we're going to add more parking uh, and several new attractions, including a small theater, a gray whale observation point, and new buildings for our employees. I'm sure you're aware environmental report is required. I'm just uh, not finding it for whatever reason. Excuse me. Well, it's mostly just improvements to the existing site. I didn't think we had to. Hmm. We've also got some more concerns on the committee. Yes, what about traffic? If more people come to the park, Hawthorne Boulevard is going to be backed up. We also need to study energy usage. More people and attractions need more power. Look, these are all things that can be worked out. But look, Marineland is the biggest employer in this city, and it brings in more tax revenue than any other business. Uh, If we don't do these necessary improvements, our troubles are going to get a lot worse than some traffic on PV Drive South. Marineland has a bad reputation now, and we have an awful lot of hard work. If we were open all year, we would have had 820,000 visitors in 1977. That's 80,000 less than in 76. Winter attendance was down to 400, 500 people a day this year. But with some work, in five years, we could be at, you know, 1.35 million visitors a year. And, you know, we don't need your money. We have that. We just need your support.
With the park closed and the much-needed improvements to keep it competitive in limbo, the future of Marineland was shaky to say the least. The Hanna-Barbera era began in a fog of uncertainty. Could the park be ready for its most lucrative summer season in 1978? Or would it be sunk by red tape? On the next episode of LA's Own Marine Land, we'll get to the conclusion of the battle between Marineland, Rolling Hills Estates, and Rancho Palos Verdes. Then, we'll take a break from business and get eye-to-eye with the park's star attractions, Orky and Corky. But before you exit the gates, be sure to get your hand stamped so you can come back through the turnstile without having to buy another ticket. LA's Own Marine Land was written, produced, and narrated by Todd Perry. That's me. But it never would have been possible without the generous help of a wonderful team of Marinelanders who shared their stories. This episode features the voice talents of Mark Chambers and Giovanni Giorgio. For more information, references, and to support the show, visit marinelandpodcast.com and follow us on Twitter at MarinelandLAPod. Please be sure to sign up for our Patreon page where you can learn even more about the history of Marineland by listening to full interviews with 19 people closest to the park. You'll also get the Patreon-exclusive episode, Making Marineland, that tells the backstory of how this podcast came to be. Get over 15 hours of fun for just $5.99 a month. Get started at patreon.com slash marinelandpodcast. That's patreon.com slash marinelandpodcast.